Okay, 1 Samuel 1, and I'm going to begin reading at the first verse. The Bible says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. You are already glad you're not me this morning. <laughs> and Elkanah, he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I've spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. My message today is entitled, Get Ready to Receive the Move of God. Get Ready to Receive the Move of God. Let's pray together and let's invite together the Father's blessing on us as we share the word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the beautiful name of Jesus. Lord, it's the name that opens heaven's door to your people. We thank you so much, God, for the gift of your word. Father, we ask that you would touch our hearts right now. Let our hearts be good soil, Lord, in this next time. Lord, soil that can receive and hold on to and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Lord Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us, they are spirit and life. So, Holy Spirit, please come, minister life to us out of God's word this morning. If you agree with that, would you say amen and amen. Well, it's really great to share the word here with you today uh, from the Phase 2 Sunday pulpit for the first time. Uh, it's very exciting. And uh, we're at a great transition point, as you know, as a church family. And last week, Pastor Glenn brought us a message entitled, Now What? And Pastor spoke with us about how we can move forward as a congregation. If you missed that message, uh, please make sure that you catch it online. Uh, you can listen to all of our messages on our website. We also have an audio podcast, if you didn't know that. You can also catch all the, the video of our sermons on our YouTube channel. So instead of HT Church 
www.htchurch.com. If you go to htchurch.tv, that will take you to our YouTube channel, and uh, all of our messages are there. So make sure, if you were not able to catch Pastor's message uh, last week, that you grab it online. But now that we are in phase two, I believe it's God's intention, I believe it's the Father's heart to release a powerful move of His Spirit in our church as well as the community. There's a growing, amen, there's a growing hunger to seek God in prayer. And you know what, church, that hunger itself is the sign that God wants to move among us. Centuries ago, the great Bible commentator Matthew Henry said, when God intends great mercy for his people, the first thing he does is he sets them to praying. You catch that? When God intends great mercy for you, the first thing he will do for you is get you to start praying. Our task is to press into God in faith to receive his mercies, even though we may face challenges. See, the Bible teaches us that in the uncertain times, in the uncertain seasons of our lives, God is still at work. Six amens on that. The rest of you... The rest of you will be shouting by 12.15, don't worry about it. But church, when we're under pressure, our weak humanity can be tempted at times to ask if God really cares. See, we get worn down by conflicts and by circumstances, but there's nothing new under the sun. Way back in Psalm 4, David said, Many people are asking, who can show us anything good? That's a cynical question, isn't it? It's born out of frustration that your answers haven't come yet and that the change you've been hoping for hasn't yet arrived. Sometimes we're tempted to agree with that cynicism and say, yeah, that's, that's right, I'm not really expecting anything much to happen. But thank God David did not surrender to the pessimism of his times. In fact, the very next line in that psalm that he wrote says, Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. In faith, he looked to God and he waited expectantly for something good. The Christian knows that trials will strengthen our faith and that trials will purify our faith if we don't give in to weariness or to opposition. But that can be a challenge for any of us just as we see that it is for Hannah. Hannah's story takes place around 1100 BC, which is about 100 years before David became the king of Israel. This was a critical time in the life of God's people. Joshua had led them into their promised land, but now they were desperately in need of revival. They needed to move into the next phase of God's plan for them, but they were stuck in idolatry. In fact, the Bible says every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. And whenever God would graciously deliver them from their oppressors, they would quickly reject God and turn away from him again. God's good intention was not just to give them the land, but for them to be blessed in that land and walk in spiritual maturity. And in order for Israel to receive the move of the Holy Spirit that he wanted to send them, God would have to strengthen the nation in some important ways. And for that, his plan was to use Samuel. God at that time was working to raise up the prophetic ministry, and Samuel would be instrumental in that. God was also developing the kingly ministry. He was going to use Samuel and David to raise up leaders all across the nation. And God was also working to build up the priestly ministry. And Samuel and David also would pave the way for the temple to be built so that worship could arise to God out of Jerusalem 24 hours a day. Samuel was vital in birthing or revitalizing those ministries. We don't think about Samuel too much, but he was like a second Moses for Israel. Under Moses, the people were born as a nation, But under Samuel, they began to reach adulthood. And God did such a powerful work through him in what he constructed that at least two out of those three ministries continued to to function. They continued to roll on for the next 700 years, and that's pretty good. 
God needed a Samuel to accomplish those things. But church, here's what I want us to see today. In order to bring forth a Samuel, God must first produce a Hannah. It wasn't enough for Samuel just to have a mother. Everybody has a mother. The question is, what kind of mother? Do you have a mother who walks in step with God's plan? A mom who consecrates you to God and who also intercedes for you powerfully? I hope you do, but Samuel certainly did. And the reason he did was because God made sure of it. See, God's worth is birthed through men and women whom he uses for his purposes. He chooses to work through us. In fact, how many of you know that God's plan is people? Now, all the theologians out there, don't get nervous. I didn't say God needs to use us. I said God chooses to use us. But listen, if God ever seems to be working or acting on his own, I think you can be pretty sure that somebody somewhere was probably praying about that issue. And whenever God wanted to deliver his people, you know what he did? He sent a man. And when he wanted to work the greatest deliverance of all, God did not send an idea. He sent his own son. To get a Samuel, God first needed a Hannah. That was the move of the Holy Spirit that Israel needed then. And church, I want to suggest to you that in order to give birth to the move that God wants to give us now, God will need us to become like Hannah also so that we can give birth to something that's according to his will. You see, Hannah needed to become Hannah 2.0. God will also train us and try us along the way like he did Hannah until we become the next and better version of ourselves. Until we persevere in faith and receive the blessing and our Samuel is finally born. She named that baby Samuel, which means heard by God. I like that. And when a similar work of the Holy Spirit has been finished inside you, you will have the same testimony that Hannah did. You'll be able to say, God heard me. And that applies to us individually, and certainly it applies to us as a congregation. And I want to share with you today how we can press in like Hannah and prepare to receive the move of God, both for our church and for ourselves, for our homes. There are three keys to doing this that I find in Hannah's story. And the first one is this, push on through your obstacles and your opposition. Push on through your obstacles and your opposition. Hannah is one of the greatest examples of pushing through to receive God's promises. Hannah learned, as we all have to, that God uses the problems and the personalities who are in our lives. How many of you know those may be annoying blessings at times? But still they are... Don't, don't amen too much there, okay? But, but still they are blessings because they help me to grow. They help me to press in. They spur me on so that I lay a hold of the answer in God. What does Hannah teach us here? First, Hannah teaches us to keep on pushing when people provoke us. Keep on pushing when people provoke us. Hannah was provoked by a cruel rival. Hannah's husband, Elkanah, did what many unwise men did in those days, which was take two wives only one wife, Penina, was blessed with children. Her name means literally a jewel, uh, like a pearl, and boy was she ever. In fact, she was a real gem. So her name was Jewel, but there was nothing beautiful about her character. Now at that time, before the temple was built, Israel worshipped in a tabernacle, which was a kind of semi-permanent tent. And Elkanah faithfully brought the whole family up every year to worship the Lord in that place. It was at a place called Shiloh. Now, Penina was constantly tormenting Hannah, but even during those holy festivals of the Lord, she would mock Hannah for having no children. 
And as a result, while other people were celebrating and feasting, where could you find Hannah? You could find her fasting and weeping. Barrenness is always a difficult trial, but perhaps it was even more so in those days because people were not reluctant to put shame on people who were infertile. In those days, they felt that a man was justified in divorcing his wife for barrenness. And no one in that culture would have actually thought any less of Elkanah for divorcing Hannah. But of course, if that had happened, she had been alone. She would have been alone, and in that society, probably destitute as well. So Hannah's barrenness was difficult enough to deal with without Penina pouring salt in her wounds. Now, your struggle may be different. It may be something else, but church, be assured that there will often be a Penina to remind you of what you lack. Your Penina stands ready to remind you that God's word to you hasn't yet come to pass. Like Hannah's cradle, your hope is empty right now while Penina is enjoying her blessings and she's proud of it. Painfully, Penina was an enemy who ought to have been an ally. These women shared a home, and they might have had common goals for the family's well-being. But we never see that Penina comforted Hannah or lent her a sympathetic ear. Supposedly, they were both worshipers of Yahweh, but I certainly don't see Penina taking any prayer requests. Instead, she made Hannah miserable, and it says that she did so deliberately. Bible says this went on year after year, and that means, in other words, for many years. When it says year after year, it also means Penina never took a year off. See, she never grew in her own heart. There never came a time when she said, you know what, God has blessed me. Maybe I should lighten up on Hannah a little bit. That never happened. And even in God's presence, Penina was mocking Hannah, insinuating that God did not favor her. But Hannah kept pushing on. She never retaliated. We never even read that she responded to that in any way. She was just one of those faithful souls who can trust God for her future, even in the middle of affliction. The Bible just says that she prayed, and then she prayed some more, and then she just kept on praying. And she wouldn't stop pushing through even when she was provoked. Another thing Hannah teaches us is to keep on pushing when people patronize you. Keep on pushing when people patronize you. You know, Hannah had somebody else in her life who was hurtful, and that was her husband. Elkanah seems to have been a good man, and during the feasting, it says he gave her extra portions, showing that he loved her. But like many of us men, and ladies, please don't say amen too fast here, but like many of us men, Elkanah was a little bit clueless. In verse 8, Elkanah says, Hannah, why do you weep? Why don't you eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Elkanah might have loved Hannah, but it seems that he didn't really sympathize with her. His questions are patronizing and insensitive. He says, why are you weeping? Now, when you read that question, you know for sure that Hannah was a woman of God, if only because the next verse does not say, and behold, Hannah began to smite Elkanah. <laughs> but really, Elkanah, you actually asked her why she was crying? And then proving that the male ego was very much alive and well 3,000 years ago, he says that just having him is better than having 10 sons. Ouch. See, because he had many sons and daughters with Penina, it's clear that Elkanah did not feel Hannah's sense of loss. The Hebrew indicates to us that he might also have been chiding her a bit because when it says that she had a grieving heart, that could also mean in Hebrew that she had a bad heart. So on top of everything else, he might also have been accusing her of having a grudge against Penina. 
Here's another great lesson from Hannah's life. When we are feeling forsaken, when we're feeling spiritually barren, church, there may only be a few who will understand our heart. See, no one who hasn't struggled like you can fully understand you. And that doesn't mean that they don't care. doesn't mean that they're not wonderful people, but it does mean that it's hard for them to understand your motivations, and it's hard for them to get your tears. Sometimes there's an Elkana in your life, and what he wants you to do is settle. See, Elkana thinks that whatever you do have is a fine substitute for the desire of your heart. And Elkanah in your life tells you to just, just give up your dream and just be content with what you have. Church, I say let's have the faith and wisdom of Hannah instead. See, she knew that her husband might be able to give her a double portion of food, but she had a calling and a hunger that could only be satisfied by what God's hand could give her. And sometimes, sometimes those well-meaning people in our lives only serve to hold us back. And that's because God planted a burden in your heart. And he gave you a Holy Spirit calling that's for you. And only you can walk that out. Like Hannah, our challenge is to pursue the burdens of our hearts without giving up and without responding poorly to others. Like silent Hannah, sometimes the best thing to do is simply not respond to people who don't get it. Hannah kept on pushing in spite of those who provoked her, those who patronized her. And third, Hannah teaches us to keep on pushing when people persecute you. Keep on pushing when they persecute you. Hannah already had a bully and a clueless husband in her life, but then she encountered a judgmental person who misunderstood her pursuit of God. In verse 12, as Hannah continued praying, she found that she was being watched. Eli, the high priest, had placed her under his critical surveillance, and he misjudged her badly. You see, Eli in this story represents the believers we admire who disappoint us. The mature people who should be able to help us, but for whatever reason, they don't help us or can't. Eli, in our story, we find out as we go deeper into Samuel, Eli was going blind, which symbolizes to us the fact that he had lost his discernment. And so he totally misreads Hannah and Hannah's situation. How disappointing that was. You see, out of everybody in the entire nation, we might have expected Eli, who had served God as his priest for 60 years, to see that this woman praying in front of him was in agony of soul. And instead, all he could see was just one more person getting tipsy at the festival. Do you know that sometimes your Christian friends can misunderstand you like this? They might be wrong about your motives, or they may find your hunger for God to be, well, just a little bit excessive. Your zeal and your need for God is just a little too much for them at times. And so they say things to you like, you know, you have to be reasonable, even in church. You know, a little bit's okay, but, you know, save that dramatic stuff for when those Randy Clark people come to town. You know, dial it down. Church, listen, you just keep praising Jesus anyway. Don't hide your worship flags in the closet for anybody. See, Eli didn't get Hannah, and some of your friends may not get you, because just like Hannah, you have a burden from heaven that God has placed in your soul. Push through it. Like Hannah pushed through in spite of bullies, in spite of the well-meaning people around her, and even the uptight religious people that criticized her. Throughout all of that, we never see that Hannah made any snappy comebacks or any comebacks at all, really. She continued to always be unfailingly humble and respectful, even to Eli. We never read that she lost her faith or dropped that burden, and neither can you if you want to see God move. We never read that she gave up, and you can't give up either. 
And we never read that she stopped praying, and neither can you. How can we press in and receive the move of God? Three keys from Hannah. The first one is to push on in the face of obstacles and opposition. The second one is this. Pour out your heart to God in prayer. Pour out your heart to God in prayer. In the passage that we read, we do see Hannah praying or weeping several times. In verse 15, Hannah explains herself to Eli. She says, I have poured out my soul before the Lord. That's a beautiful word picture, and it's one that a number of people use in the Bible. That expression of pouring out your soul, it comes from the idea, of course, of pouring out water on the ground. And just as we might pour out water out of a pot or a pitcher, Hannah was taking all the burdens of her heart. She was taking everything that she was feeling, all that she was experiencing inside, and she was pouring all of it out to God in prayer. Hannah needed to pray. The reason was that because although she was loved, she had not yet borne any fruit. And her situation is actually a picture for us of every praying believer. Now, church, I want you to think here with me. I want you to, did, did you have your protein this morning? Okay, sometimes the oatmeal doesn't cut it, right? Sometimes you got to have the eggs, you got to have a little bacon, right? Listen, the Father loves us, and we know the Father loves us. But yet there is fruit that we're not bearing yet, that we haven't borne yet. In fact, there's a whole realm of blessings from God that we haven't yet touched or entered into. And God desires to bring us into those blessings, but we often fail to experience them because we're not reaching out to him in prayer the way that Hannah did. And I'm not saying that this morning to condemn anybody, but I'm saying that, church, to encourage us as we consider what a wonderful and gracious Father we have. You may say, well, why would God hide his blessings from his children? Why would he hide himself? Well, he's not really hiding himself or his blessings, but if it seems that way to us at times, he's only concealing those blessings from us so so that we might seek them and find them in him. Hannah learned that some things may require a little extra prayer. They may even require some fasting and tears. Here's the sticky part, though. You see, the Bible never tells me which things in my life are going to need that extra prayer. And that's because it's probably different for every single person. Now listen, what I'm about to share I think is going to be helpful for some of us here today when we think about sometimes what people call the mystery of prayer, right? Listen, church, Jesus said that in our praying we should what? We should ask, we should seek, and we should knock. But think about this with me. It seems that not everyone has to knock for the same things. It seems that in God's love and his wisdom, he has structured our lives so that each one of us will stay dependent and leaning on him. You may have more grace for something than your neighbor, and we all have grace, it seems, for different things. For example, you may not need to knock for finances. Maybe you only need to ask, but others need to knock and engage what may seem like prolonged or constant intercession in order to get a breakthrough in that area. On the other hand, some may struggle with anger. Other people may have constant struggles with their kids. But maybe those things have never been a problem for you. Church, listen, get this. May may the Lord help us. We are all weak without him, but each of us is weak in a different way. God uses my weaknesses to keep me leaning on him and to keep me calling out to him. And then in a very strange way, I can learn to appreciate my own particular weaknesses that are my weaknesses because when I am weak, Paul said, then it's actually that I'm really strong. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness. And the Greek there has the idea when it says made perfect in weakness, what it means is God's strength when you're weak, it's allowed to have its way. God's strength is allowed to run its full course in you and become complete. And that's powerful. 
So in Hannah's life, it was the issue of barrenness for her that caused her to pour out her soul to God. Not just to get a Samuel, but because God wants to get a different Hannah. Perhaps we've all gone to God at some point and asked him, right? Lord, why do I have to be so weak in this area? Only the Lord knows the answer to that. But just remember, your neighbor may be looking over at you and wondering, how come she doesn't have the problem that I have? Let's bring those things to God in prayer. And again, we learn from Hannah. You see, in her weakness, God allowed her to be pushed by her opponents over and over. Why? So that she would press into God over and over. And she learned to pour out her soul to God constantly with an ever-increasing tenacity and faith. She would end up mourning in a time that was appointed for celebrating. She would end up fasting in a time that was appointed for feasting. Her desperate praying not only changed the circumstances, they changed Hannah. And when I pray and fast over my weaknesses, the same will happen to me. Hannah was already fasting and praying, but her husband's thoughtless words drove her to even another level. The Bible says that she got up and she went to the doorpost of the tabernacle. Now that may not mean much to us, but church, that was the closest that a woman was allowed to get to God's presence. You may remember that uh, in the Old Testament, your personal status determined how close you could approach the ark of God's glory. Women could only go so far in. Men could go a little bit further. And priests only could enter into the holy places. And here's Hannah going as far as she could. You see, she was determined to do whatever she could to get a hold of God. She poured out her soul and she pressed into God's presence as far as anybody would allow her to. Church, Don't wait for Elkanah to make light of your troubles, to be dismissive about what you're going through before you'll pray. Don't wait for your penina to start throwing your sorrows in your face before you will fast. Reach out today in prayer like Hannah did as she prayed, the Bible says, to the Lord Sabaoth. The Lord Sabaoth is a special name for God in the Old Testament. We usually translate it in English as Lord of Hosts, which is a pretty old-fashioned English expression. What it means in modern English is that he's the Lord of armies. He's the God of angel armies. We need to know him again, church, as Hannah did, as the God of angel armies. We need to build our faith again by remembering the power and the greatness of the God that we're serving. Let's read and remember again about the great things that he's done for his people and what he wants to do for his children. You see, he wants to be Yahweh Sabaoth. He wants to be the Lord of hosts for you. You may say, well, Pastor Nick, it's been pretty rough for me. How long am I going to have to pray anyway before something changes? I don't have the answer to that, but I do know that if you keep pouring out your heart to him, there will come a day that you'll get a word from heaven just like Hannah finally did. As Hannah poured out her soul and was outside of the tabernacle seeking God's glory as far as she could get into it, Eli recovered his spiritual senses, and he gave her a priestly word of blessing. And I know she might have gotten some stray words of encouragement along the way here and there, but this time she knew in her heart that through her prayers, she had broken through. This time she had the witness of the Holy Spirit inside her heart, and as, you know, preachers like to say, she knew that she knew. She knew that she had gotten the victory in prayer. And now, by faith, the Bible says she was able to break her fast, and her face was no longer sad. Now she would have a son. May the Holy Spirit give us grace to believe that God 
can make us into a Hannah, a person who is destined to display his grace to the world and show the world what he can do. Just like Hannah, listen, the thing that's driving you to God in prayer, that thing could be the very thing in which he wants to show off and give you a testimony. Hannah's name in Hebrew is Hana, and it means grace. And God will show off his grace to you in your life when you pray about that nagging thing in, her, in your life the way that she did. How do we get ready to receive the move of God? Keep pushing through your obstacles. Keep pouring out your heart to God in prayer. And finally this, partner with God to see his purposes come to pass. Partner with God to see his purposes come to pass. You know, in a strange way, it seems that Penina was actually right about Hannah not being favored. Because verse 4 tells us that it was God who had actually closed her womb. And without her knowing it, Hannah had become a picture of what God's people had become spiritually. She was full of promise and yet barren of life. God allowed this trial to come to her. Why? So that he could do a great work of grace within her. For Hannah, this was a wonderful personal story. But for God's people, her story shows us how to pray and receive the revival that God is wanting to send. The name Hannah means grace or favored, but if anything, her own name had become a reproach and was painful to her. And yet, if she could look at it again with eyes of faith, her name contained a promise And her name was actually a challenge. You see, the woman named Grace would have to fast and pray to see grace come and to see revival in Israel. Her husband, Elkanah's name, meant created by God. And he's also a picture of God's people in our story. You see, Israel was created by God. But they didn't have the life of God anymore. All they had to show for it was religion. All they had was the outward jewels, the penina of their outward observances. There was no revival in Israel until a woman named for grace decided that she had had enough of being barren and cried out to give birth to a new work of grace that would bring life to the nation. As she fasted and prayed, Hannah's heart changed, and she began to partner with God for his purposes. Don't misunderstand me, please. There was nothing at all selfish about her wanting a child. But church, the more she sought God, the more that her heart became intertwined with his heart. The more she prayed, what Hannah wanted and what God wanted became the very same thing. May it be so with us as well. Worship team, you can come back, please. Hannah makes a solemn vow to the Lord, promising to give her son back to God as a Nazarite for his entire life. Now, that's not a Nazarene, that's a Nazarite. If you don't know what that is, that means that you've consecrated yourself to God with a, a special and very restrictive lifestyle. So you see, Hannah reached the point where she was willing to offer her child to God in two ways. First, Samuel would stay in God's service for his entire life. Now, priests only serve uh, until age 50, but Hannah's intention was for him to keep serving God always. And second, right from the time of his birth, Hannah would separate Samuel from worldly things. He would be more devoted to God than ordinary people were. And there were very few people in the scripture who were dedicated like that to the Lord from birth. God's design for Samuel was to be extraordinary. And the more that she prayed, the more Hannah began to share that design for her son. You see, she got to the point, church, where she no longer just wanted a son. She wanted to bear the son God had called her to produce. Now put your thinking cap on with me here because this is, this is deep stuff and we don't have any PowerPoint screens yet for you. But I want you to see, church, that Hannah got her answer. 
but God had worked on her heart in such a way that he got his answer too at the same time. They had become partners together. God needed a radical, sold out man in order to bring revival. Hannah wanted a baby, but the more she sought God, the more she picked up on what God wanted. Finally, Hannah reached the point where she said, God, if you give me this baby, I'll give him back to you so that he can be a radical, sold-out man who will bring in revival. When Hannah, amen. When Hannah partnered with God for his purposes, she received the desire of her heart. And so did God. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and what? And he will give you the desires of your heart. But guess what, church? Those desires are actually also the desires of his heart. Friends, we need to give our prayers and our dreams to God so he can shape them. And while he's shaping them, guess what? He's also shaping us. And if we do that, we can receive the move of God that he wants to send us. And we'll be able to say like Hannah, yes, God heard us. Maybe like Hannah, God's trying to bring some of us to a place in prayer where we can say, God, God, you know, there's been just a little bit too much of me in my praying. God, answer my prayers the way that you want to, even if it's not quite the way that I would have preferred. Lord, I'm not willing to give up praying for this because after all, I think it was your idea, but what I am willing to do, Father, is consecrate it all to you. Maybe God is looking for people to say, Lord, when my Samuel arrives, you can have him. When my answer to prayer comes, God, you can have it. We don't always pray like that, of course, but here's my sticky question for the day. What if we let God do more of the choosing for us? You know, Jesus said it was the Father's good pleasure to give us what? The kingdom. To be honest, if you can pray and get something better than the kingdom that the Father intends to give you, well, you're welcome to it. And as a friend of mine likes to say, that's good preaching right there. Church, listen, God got the man he needed and the revival he wanted because he got the mother that was required to birth such a man. Many would say that it was her trials that made her a model of faith. And we, we magnify, we notice people's trials, don't we? But it wasn't her trials that made her. It was her responses to her trials. Indeed, by, by many measures, because of those responses, Hannah, you know, is the most spiritually successful woman in the entire Old Testament. There's no other woman in the Bible who goes to the tabernacle. And believe it or not, there's no other woman in the Old Testament that has a single one of her prayers recorded besides Hannah. She's also the only woman to make a vow to God and keep it. Because she partnered with God in her afflictions, she became an amazing vessel for God's purposes. She became a model of faith that men and women alike should imitate in the characteristics of what she did. And church, what are we asking for from God this morning? Are we seeking blessing? Do we need deliverance? Are we asking God maybe to move in the life of a wayward child or spouse or friend? I hope many of you are also praying and asking God to send his revival glory to our church and to our nation. And friends, if you can feel him pulling on your heart today to pray with a little desperation, then you can be a Hannah today also. And through your prayers, you can birth a new work of grace, just like the woman named for grace did. I think God is calling us this year to press into him and receive what the Holy Spirit wants to send us. We can receive the blessings that God has planned to give us, some of those blessings that he's concealed for us to find if, if we don't give up. Keep pushing through your obstacles and your opposition. Keep pouring out your heart to the Lord in prayer. And keep on 
partnering with him so that you can see his purposes coming to pass. That's how we get ready to receive the move of God. Come on, stand with me together. Let's give Jesus some blessing in his house. Amen. Come on, give him a good hand of praise.